Welcome everyone to the annual Having Her Center lecture. Um, my name is Stephen Norris, and I am the Walter Havinghurst Professor of Russian History and Director of the Havinghurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies. Founded in 2000, the Havinghurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies is devoted to research about Russia, Eastern Europe, and Eurasia, to service and learning activities that provide a greater understanding of this region for students, and to programs designed to foster interdisciplinary understanding on the most important questions related to the future of this area. Our signature event of the year is the annual Havinghurst Lecture, which aims to spotlight important people, events, and issues from the region. The first ever Havinghurst Lecture was delivered by then Librarian of Congress, James Billington, 20 years ago in March 2001. The last two have featured Nobel laureate Hertha Müller and former Kyrgyz President Rosa Atumbayeva. Our annual lecture this year will take a slightly different format, one more Zoom friendly, but one still dedicated to answering the most important questions in our field. In this case, a better understanding of the ongoing protests in Belarus. Three presenters, the scholar and activist Sasha Razor, the artist Rufina Bazlova, and the poet Valjina Mort will allow us to delve more deeply into Belarusian art, culture, memory, and their roles in sustaining political actions. The protests that began in the wake of the fraudulent August 2020 presidential elections have posed the most serious threat yet to the regime of Alexander Lukashenko, the country's authoritarian leader since 1994. By the end of 2020 alone, more than 30,000 people have been arrested in these protests, a staggering figure that one human rights organization has referred to as unprecedented repression in the country's history. More than eight months after Lukashenko claimed victory, his opponents have not given up. Artists have played prominent roles in the protests and in the interpretations of their meanings. And today we'll explore the subject of art, memory, and protest in Belarus. I'm very pleased and excited to be joined by three people, the aforementioned Sasha Razor, Rufina Bazlova, and Valjina Mort. Um, today's format, what we'll do is each will speak for about 10 minutes or so. And after that, I'll pose a question for, or, or two if we have time for all three to answer. And then we'll have time for audience questions. Our first speaker is Sasha Razor, who's a native of Belarus and holds a PhD in Slavic, East European, and Eurasian languages and cultures from UCLA. Her dissertation focused on the screenplays of Russian prose authors in the 1920s and 30s. She is also an expert on Belarusian and Ukrainian literature and culture, and is a regular contributor to the Los Angeles Review of Books, including her recent piece, The Lessons of Belarus from August 2020. Sasha recently organized an online exhibition, The History of the Belarusian Vujivanka, focusing on Rufina Bazlova's art. And she's now working with Valjina Mort on a project and will introduce their significance and some of the larger context for the Belarusian protests. Sasha, welcome and thank you for coming. Hi, Steve, and thank you for having me. So I would like to share my screen and then begin. Okay. Let's see. Yes. So can you hear me all right? Okay, so the themes of textiles and texts represented in the work of our speakers today share a lot in common. The art of writing is a little bit like weaving, but with words. And when you embellish your text with motifs and fine details, it is similar to embroidery. It is an old trope, of course, to refer to text through textile metaphor, which has been present in the world culture from Odysseus to Christo Wolf. And yet I can think of one ancient Belarusian textile tradition that speaks and relates directly to our times. So what you see on this picture is called the Abodionic towel. It is a ritual towel that literally had to be made during one day from either dusk to dawn or from sunrise to sunset. It's an old East Slavic protection ritual, which was made by women and performed toward of dangerous and evil spirits. So women would gather together during epidemics, zoonosis, pandemics, droughts, and wars, and produce this ritual fabric from beginning to the end, from spinning the threads to dressing the loom and weaving it. And afterwards, they performed magic actions with it and displayed it on the side of the roads or in churches. And the last time these rituals were performed in Belarus and recorded was actually during World War II, 
But the photograph that you see right now is a recent reconstruction by the Student Ethnographic Society in Minsk that was made during the, during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the culture work that contemporary Belarusians are doing today reminds me a little bit of this ritual because for the past eight months, we have been coming together as community and performing this collective sacrificial labor talking about our country, letting the world know about it and about our problems, but also envisioning better future through arts and letters. I am addressing you today from Los Angeles, the city that sadly operates the largest jail system in the world. And it is a critically overcrowded system. And yet it is nothing like Belarus, my home country. This is a poster made by a recent exile to Belarus and her name is Natalia Zhukova. Natalia was arrested in November for distributing flowers to senior citizens. And the poster says, my entire country is in jail. And according to Natalia, the poster has a double meaning. On the surface, it is a protest against the mass incarceration of Belarusians, but it also refers to the experience of people who live in a post-totalitarian system their entire life and some of them don't even know what freedom means. And indeed, over the past 26 years, police brutality and state violence have become a collective formative experience for generations of Belarusians who lived it as either victims, witnesses, or abusers. About five years ago, the Autozag that you see on the photo, it's a police vehicle used to transport detainees, became a paradoxical symbol of the Belarusian protest culture. And we have seen the rise of its use in contemporary art in the form of toy cars, pins, photo collages, and most recently, an installation that gives Mistetsky Arsenal. So what you see in this photo is the famous iconic work by artist Antonina Slabochikova, the author of the famous logo of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's campaign. And for this exhibition, the artist positioned the 3D object representing this logo inside a police vehicle and titled her work Requiem for a Dream. And indeed, since the beginning of protests, not just the police fans, but the very experience of incarceration that has become a central trope in forming Belarusian identity today. And the numbers, and Steve mentioned them in the introduction, are difficult to even grasp. According to the latest reports, about 34,000 underwent politically motivated detentions, 1,000 were tortured, and eight killed. 2,000 criminal cases have been opened with the, ministry, with the interior ministry and 323 persons are now considered to be political prisoners. And of course, among the arrested, there were several members of our artistic community and I'm just going to name some names. It's poet Dmitry Strotsov, Vladimir Lenkevich and Hanna Komar, as well as artists Alexei Kuzmich, Nadia Sayapina, Vladimir Hramovich, and Lesya Pcholka, among others. Performance artist Alex Pushkin is currently facing criminal charges from five to 12 years in jail, and another political prisoner, gallery Sasha Vasilievich, has been illegally detained since the end of August. And of course, Belarusian authors responded to this state-sponsored violence with a powerful flow of text. And although their publications are completely impossible inside the country, some of these texts have already appeared in print and translation, while others are still waiting for their turn. Shortly before his arrest, poet Dmitry Strotsov, whose Swedish translation you see on the screen, wrote the following line on his Facebook, you are not yet Belarusian if you have not been to jail. And Dmitry was abducted on the street back in October and spent 13 days in prison. Poet Vladimir Lenkevich and Hanna Komer were arrested earlier in September, and this is a famous photograph from their arrest. So they are not in the picture, but both of me told me that they were somewhere nearby during the arrest, and this picture was featured by the New York Times and became one of the most famous photographs from 2020. And they said that they were singing the song of Kupalinka. And Kupalinka, we call it a folk song, but the song actually has an author. Um, the author of its lyrics is uh, Mikhail Charot, 
who was a Belarusian poet murdered in 1937 at the height of Stalinist purges in the event called the Night of the Murdered Poets when Soviet authorities decided to dispose of 100 representatives of Belarusian intellectual elites, elites in the country. And Valjina Mort's new collection titled Music for the Dead and Resurrected talks about this violent legacies on the past and the questions of historic memory. It is also important to say that Valjina, whose poetic talent speaks for itself, is doing a lot of work building bridges between American and Belarusian poetic cultures. Our second speaker today, Prague-based artist Rufina Baslova, also works with themes of political violence, but differently, combining the traditional art of embroidery with internet activism and craftivism. Textiles are at the heart of our traditional culture and women continue to embroider and even weave in some villages during the 1980s. Therefore, what we are seeing today is a part of our cultural memory and a code that we share as a community. Now, I would like to provide some context for Rufina's work and show other embroidery projects and political embroideries that have recently appeared in Belarus. So craftivism emerged in Belarus as a protest ritual of a new kind that is both preconditioned by the domestic art trends of the past decade and resonates with the global transnational art narratives. Since the beginning of the protest, the idea of political embroidery has been implemented on several art platforms simultaneously. So back in August, the legendary Minsk U Gallery offered sketches to create a community documentary embroidery about the protest events in the country. And about 10 artists provided their sketches and people came together and embroidered in the U Gallery space. And unfortunately, this activity became one of the very last ones in the gallery's existence. On November 5, another event took place online. Artist Lisa Pcholka, who lives and works in Minsk, taught a workshop on craftivism titled Embroidery Practices. And you can see the screen of this event. Lesia's larger project deals with researching ritual culture and family archives. And what you see here is how she embroiders her grandmother's last names on their portraits. And on the next slide, you see embroidery collages by a German-based Belarusian artist, Marina Naprushkina, who combines protest chants with the school notebooks and archival blueprints made by her, by her father, who was an architect. Naprushkina's embroideries were recently in two exhibitions in Vienna and in Kiev, and together with Lesia's work and Rufina's exhibition that we held just recently at UCLA, the craftivist strategy of Belarusian resistance has already become a global phenomenon. And I would like to end my talk with a very interesting and inspiring example of blending textiles and texts by another immigrant to the United States, Volya Demka, who is active in our ethnic revival movement. It is my hope that Volya, whose very name means freedom, and her subversive stitches will highlight the pathos of the Belarusian traditional textiles to the international audiences. And I'm going to read an inscription that Volya wrote online and kindly allowed me to share it with you today. Here I am relieving my stress. Embroider our freedom, our will my star. To all those condemned but not guilty, tortured, broken and murdered. To all of us who saw this and will remember. I will embroider our honor, our dignity in gold and in red, our freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. And what a wonderful context and introduction for our next speaker, Rufina Baslova, who's already been mentioned in Sasha's talk, a Prague-based multi-genre artist who works in illustration, comics, artist books, puppet making, scenography, performance, and costume design. Oslova gained an international following for her series, The History of Belarusian Gushvanka, examples of which Sasha just showed and which you can see behind me in my screen, which uses the traditional folk cross-stitch medium to depict the ongoing peaceful protests in Belarus, her home country. Together with her colleagues from the Academy of Performing Arts in Prague, DAMU, she founded a creative group of puppeteers called Herring Beneath the Fur Coat. Their play Raw was nominated for the Greenhorn Award at the prestigious Figura Theater Festival in Baden, Switzerland in 2020. Rufina, thank you for joining us. Hi everyone. 
thanks for inviting me. Um, okay, my name is Lupina Baslova, and I'm joining you from Pilsen, Czech Republic. Uh, and it's uh, already uh, 9 p.m. here, so my room is a bit dark. <laughs> okay, let's start with a map of Belarus. I was born in Grodno, and the city is located in Western Belarus on the border with Lithuania and Poland. For some time, we were part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. The protests in Grodno are among the most active in Belarus, except for Minsk. Uh, in the picture, uh, you see the center of my hometown. This is the cathedral, and the prison is right next to it. Back in August, people gathered to write by the prison walls and song Muri, the international protest uh, anthem about taking down the prison walls. This song of the Catalan resistance came to us from Poland and became famous in the solidarity movement. Okay, let's take a look how it started with me and embroidery. My grandmother was a jail of all trades. She could embroider, sew, knit, you, etc. My mother can do a little less. Uh, in the picture, you can see a shirt um, that my mother made with elements of my grandmother's embroidery. In our family, we have a joke. All that was left for me was embroidery. Uh, more than 10 years ago, I explored that ornaments could be read as a kind of text. For a long time, women uh, were not um, taught to read or write, so everything they saw was reflected in their craft, which became their form of expression. Here you can see a sample of how the codification of ornament language works. Or another sample from the book by Belarusian ethnographer Mikhail Katsan, and this is how he describes the picture. As you know, the dove is a symbol of love. Uh, the three pictures show us three phases of a relationship. It totally looks like a comic strip, isn't it? Okay, uh, here is a um, project um, made in 2012 uh, and called Genoco. In English, I call it feminine nature. It was an embroidered figurative comic strip on a dress where the first and the last pictures are the same. Therefore, it's called Genoco, uh, a woman in a circle. This is my fictional myth about how women were born. You can read the full comic on my Instagram page, Rufina Baslova, all one word. Last summer, I graduated from the theater academy and decided to return to embroidery. At that moment, I was thinking about the topic of femininity, but uh, at the same time, the political events regarding the Belarusian elections surrounded me from everywhere. Of course, embroidery is an important part of Belarusian culture, tradition, and its code. My white and red motifs came from our folk culture. The events that are taking place now, after all, can be seen as the formation of the nation. I followed the news and something in me resonated with the people in Belarus. I felt angry about the lack of justice there. In the end, I channeled my feelings into, into the series historian of Belarusian Vizhivanka. And there is a funny story about the name. In Belarusian, there is a special name for an embroidered shirt, Vishivanka. In August, I was interviewed by a German journalist and she asked me, how big is a role does the Vishivanka play for Belarusian people? She spoke Russian very well, but because of a little accent, the word Vishivanka sounded like Vishivanka. So the word took a new meaning. In Belarusian, the word vizhivat means to survive. And vizhivanka was a new noun from that word. So the only one answer I had was, yes, it plays a very important role because surviving is what my people are doing right now. 
Um, the stories that I picked to cover um, were based on my reactions on the situation. Since the beginning of the protest, I've been posting my works on Instagram. What you see there is a vector teacher or vector graphic. Uh, then some of my mm, works were embroidered. Mm, some of them exist in limited editions uh, of signs and numbered silk screen prints. But unfortunately, I haven't managed to depict everything. Like the relation, uh, my pictures are still work in progress. Uh, now I would like to show you some of my artworks and comment on them. Almost everything I know about the events in Belarus I find on the internet. Many, very often inspiration comes from viral videos and pictures. For example, this comic strip is about Nina Baginskaya. And Nina is 73 years old. Belarusians call her the grandmother of the Belarusian revolution. She walks everywhere carrying a handmade white red white flag and she's afraid of nothing. When a police officer tried to stop her and uh, take her flag, she kicked him and said that she was just walking. This comic strip is about a Yandex taxi. Back in October, one of the protesters uh, was running from the police and the driver saved him at the last moment, just like in the movies. And this video went viral and uh, we all celebrated this little victory. The young man in the photo is the brave driver, a 21 years old student named Evgeny. And he is also originally from Grodno. Uh, this is an early work. It shows a specific situation on August 7, when uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska was banned from holding a gathering. Mm, a pro-government event was planned in Kiev Park in Minsk. Two DJs, Kirill Galanov and Vlad, Vlad Sakalov, disrupted the event by playing the song Changes by Soviet rock star Viktor Tsoi. This song was also banned in Belarus. Then the square of Changes um, pop up uh, nearby in Minsk uh, courtyard where portraits of these DJs were painted on the side of a transformer box. The mural has been painted over more than 10 times, but it reappears again and again. The Roman Bondarenko, the artist behind the square of changes, tragically died on November 11. Strangers in masks went to the neighborhood to take down the white, red, white protest ribbons. People tie them because it's more difficult to take down ribbons than a single flag. When the artist went out to protect these ribbons, he was beaten, arrested, and he died the next day in the hospital. Just imagine, he was murdered by ribbons. This was a terrible shock to the Russians. When Roman died, the square of changes itself changed forever. And I made this image to honor Roman's memory. Another popular motif in my work is a cockroach. Everyone in Belarus knows what this is. Everyone has read the fairy tables by Soviet writer Karnei Chukovsky, in which a cockroach oppresses all uh, other animals and makes uh, their lives miserable. In summer 2020, popular blogger Sergei Tikhanovsky started a campaign that he called Stop the Cockroach. Thousands of people took the, to the street carrying sleepers and making the gesture of smashing the cockroach. Sergei Tikhanovsky was arrested very soon and his wife, Svetlana Tikhanovska, decided to run in his place. If you're familiar with the Chukovsky's text, then you might also know that at the end, the cockroach is eaten by a bird. In my works, a bird is a funny character that sometimes finds itself in ridiculous situations. For example, there is a bird being chased by the right police just because it wanted to eat a bug, which is actually natural for birds. This illustrates the all absurdity happening in the country. In another work titled Go Away, 
I wanted to show that in Belarus, not only the people, but even the flora and fauna turned away from Lukashenko. Um, in picture self-care, birds are just a symbol of uh, peace. This illustration was inspired by peaceful gatherings of citizens in Brest and St. Petersburg under the pretext of feeding the pigeons. While my people uh, in, in my country are still surviving, I try to respond to current events as much as possible to support my people. Well, I don't know what the next month will bring us. I continue to draw a better future for the Russian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rufina. That was, a, that was excellent. Um, our next speaker is Valgina Mort, who is a poet and translator born in Minsk, Belarus. She's the author of three poetry collections, Factory of Tears, from Copper Canyon Press in 2008, Collected Body, also from Copper Canyon Press in 2011, and most recently, Music for the Dead and Resurrected, which Sasha showed earlier with FSG in 2020. Uh, Mort has received many prestigious fellowships, has been honored with several prizes, and appeared in major publications. Her work has appeared in major publications, including The New Yorker, uh, Granta, and the collection Best American Poetry. Her recent book was named a Best Poetry Book of, of 2020 by both NPR and the New York Times. Uh, Valgina teaches at Cornell University, where she's joining us from today. Welcome, Valgina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you so much, Sasha and Rufina. And um, hello and welcome to everybody. Um, I do not have any screens to share, so my bit would be a bit more like radio and less like TV, perhaps if you would like to rest your eyes a bit and listen to my voice, you could do that. I'm going to read four poems from my new book, Music for the Dead and Resurrected, and um, I'll start with a poem called Little Songs. Um, for me, um, um, and I don't know how much poetry you read in your life, so let me just say that I think that poetry is often about tension, exploring tension between various things, and um, one of the very Belarusian tensions that this poem explores is um, the fact of being born in one place, in one house, uh, working the same part of land, um, never going anywhere in a uh, country um, with closed borders for a long time. Um, and yet uh, lots of people do not seem to be able to die in that house on that plot of land. So in their death, somehow they're dislocated. Little songs. Over these houses, like dead men's hands, the roofs are folded. A train, dogs rattle chains. Window sills snowed over with wary flies. Amelia drinks thick coffee. Yanina shares utensils like playing cards. Yusefa, after loud theatrical farewells, is dead. Yusefa crunches members of broken households. She budgets children and relatives, subtracts the dead, carries over the missing. It is a math problem she buries with herself. All windows in bright white, a step house with step inhabitants, born in this kitchen, back three times a day to have a meal in the place of their birth. Yet, None is buried anywhere close. Yanina shovels snow piles of flies. Like a manly tear, a bird glides across the air. Chains follow dogs as if chains were discharged like slime. Justice has turned out to be more terrifying than injustice. Yanina falls like dust onto her bed to look healthy, leave that to animals. Once a tank drives through a street here, 
like an elephant, it waves its trunk from right to left. An elephant in our village, instead of hiding, women run to look. Since then, many birds are shed across the air, the dents on cups gag many thirsty mouths. What has been done to us is smuddled with the fears of what could have been done. Our famous skills in tank production have been redirected at students and journalists. But under that roof, folded like a dead man's hands over a house, we still live. But under that roof, folded like a dead man's hands over the house, we still live, carrying buckets between a tree and a beast. And instead of evening prayers, I plead with myself to just leave you be, my dear, my undear Lord. The second poem is called Zinger which looks like a singer, yeah, when you write it, because it should be said, I think, pronounced as singer, is a brand of um, American sewing machines. Um, and um, though my, the title of the book might mislead you to believe <laughs> that it has to do with something to do with singing. In Belarus, we like to pronounce this brand of sewing machines with a German accent because um, zingers uh, were a, quite a popular trophy brought by the Soviet soldiers from Germany um, after World War II. So a lot of, a lot of uh, village families had in the attic a zinger um, and um, his hours, his poem to ours. A yolk of honey in a glass of cooling milk. Bats playful like butterflies on power lines. In all your stories, blood hangs like braids of drying onions. A village is so small, it doesn't have its own graveyard. Our souls are sapped in some water of the bogs. Men die in wars their bodies, their graves, and women burn in fire. When midsummer brings thunderstorms, we cannot sleep because our house is a wooden sieve and crescent lightning cut off our hair. The bogs ablaze, we sit all night in fear. I always thought that your old trophy zinger would hurry us away on its arched back. I thought we'd hold on to its mane of threads from loosened spools along Arabian spine, the same threads that were sewn into my skirts, my underthings for his bras. What smell came from those threads you had so long, sewn in, pulled out, sewn back into the clothes that held together men who fall apart, undressed. The same threads between my legs, I lash them and the zinger gallops and sky hangs from the lightning thread. As in that poem, on Berlin's Jägerstrasse, Aryan whores are wearing shirts ripped off the sliced chests of our girls. My zinger horsey does everything have to be like a poem. So there's a little bit here about the Belarusian weaving of linen shirts and that um, darkly ironic exchange of, um, of the traditional, traditional clothing that was brought um, by the German soldiers back for their honeys back home as gifts, as souvenirs taken uh, down from the dead bodies in exchange for sewing machines. Uh, the third poem is called Bus Stops Ars Poetica. And um, in the center of it, it has this purse 
with two buckles. And when you open it, it looks like a screaming mouth. Um, we will talk about memory and testimony. And uh, I believe that in a culture like Belarusian culture where uh, lots of survivors are not there because there are so few survivors to tell the testimony where, where real witness uh, have not survived, has not survived, it's the inanimate objects that are imbued, are imbued with testimony and are giving testimony. And it is an artist's uh, job to listen to these speechless objects. Uh, the, the, survive, the real only survivors. Not books, but a street open my mouth like a doctor's spatula. One by one, streets introduce themselves with the names of national murderers. In the state archives, carvers hardened like scabs over the ledges. Inside a tiny apartment, I built myself into a separate room. Inside a tiny apartment, I built myself into a separate room, peopled it with the calibans of plans for the future. Future that runs on the schedule of public buses, from the zoo to the circus, what future? What is your alibi for these ledgers, these streets, this apartment future? In the purse that held through seven wars, the birth certificates of the dead, my grandmother hid from me chocolates. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. Its two shiny buckles watched me through doors, through walls, through jazz. Who has taught you to be a frightening faced purse? I kiss your buckles. I swear myself your subject. August, apples, I have no body. August, for me a ripe apple is a brother. For me a four-legged table is a pet. In the temple of supermarket I stand stand like a candle in the line to the priestesses who preserve the knowledge of sausage prices, the virginity of milk cartons, my future small change. Future that runs on the schedule of public buses, streets introduce themselves with the names of national murderers. I built myself into a separate room where memory, the illegal migrant in time, cleans up after imagination. In a room where memory strips the beds, linens that hardened like scabs on the mattresses, I kiss little apples, my brothers. I kiss the buckles that watch us through walls, through years, through jazz. Chocolates from a purse that held through seven wars, the birth certificates of the dead. Hold me, brother apple. And I'll read the last poem, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. This poem is called To Antigone Dispatch. Antigone, uh, as you remember, was a Sophocles heroine who insisting on giving her slain brother a proper funeral, despite the orders not to do so. And um, she asks her sister Ismena to assist her but Ismena does not dare to disobey the law. Uh, and um, so in this poem, a Belarusian poet invites Antigone uh, to assist her <laughs> um, uh, in, uh, and to share these um, skills at, uh, of proper, proper burials uh, in a country where um, bones are still um, scattered around the sites of mass executions. Antigone, dead siblings are set. As for the living, pick me for a sister. I too love a proper funeral. Dragged against sisters, pop up burial. Landlady, I make the rounds of graves, keeping up my family's top-notch properties. On a torture instrument called an accordion, I stretch my bones into fingers of a witch. My guts have been emptied like bellows for the best sound. 
Once we settle your brother, I'll show you forests of the unburied dead. We'll clean the way only two sisters can clean a house. No bones scattered like dirty socks, no ashes at the bottom of kneecaps. Why bicker with husbands about dishes when we've got mountains of skulls to shine? Labor and retribution will share, not girly secrets. Brought up by dolls and monuments, I have the bearings of a horse and a bitch. I'm cement in tears. You can spot my graves from afar, marble like newborn skin. Here, history comes to an end, like a movie with rolling credits of headstones, with nameless credits of mass graves. Every ditch, every hill is suspect. Pick me for a sister, Antigone. In this suspicious land, I have a bright shovel of a face. Thank you. Thank you so much, Falgina. Um, I've posted in the chat if someone would like to ask a question when we get to the audience questions, so you can either do so by posing it in the chat or you can indicate with a cue that you would like to ask one. Um, but let me start our conversation by referring to a, a recent NPR interview you gave, Algina, where you talked about your poetry as works that where you remember through feeling emotional history. Um, an idea I find really fascinating and a concept I find fascinating as a historian, but one that I think could also apply to Rufina's art and the way she described her art and the uses of art in Belarus today that, that Sasha covered. So I thought I might begin by asking you first, Algina, to expand on this notion. What does it mean to remember through feeling emotional history and how it applies to your poetry, and then maybe have Rufina talk about how it might apply to her work and Sasha, how it might apply to other works she discussed. So what does feeling emotional history and art help capture? Uh, thank you, Stephen. I think that as a poet and a historian, we begin in opposition to each other. Uh, I think that the poet and artist in general explores the idea of how history feels. Um, and um, this is what I mean by that emotional history. Um, I think uh, one has to distinguish between um, official history, collective memory, um, but also the way that an artist approaches um, her obsessions with uh, history. Uh, and uh, in Belarusian context, official memory relies solely on an emptied, an empty, locked archive, right? It is, um, uh, uh, it is, it relies on, situ on a situation where the archives are either locked or destroyed. Uh, Sasha brought up the night of his executed poets in her presentation and uh, before the poets were executed on that night, um, all of their manuscripts, all of their work was burned. Um, of course, there's a history decade after de decade of confiscated property. And with that, we're losing, um, we're losing uh, fa familial family archive, uh, e evidence is confiscated. And today we see the way um, official memory is being created by silencing everybody who could tell an alternative story. That is to say, journalists, writers, photographers, lawyers, anybody who, who, construct, who constructs a narrative, an alternative narrative. And um, Kurapati, the site of mass executions next to the capital uh, of Belarus, Minsk, is, um, well, a horror site as it is also a metaphor for what official memory and official history is, because we still do not know who, how many, and why is buried in this site of mass execution that is like, um, this um, uh, elephant, well, more than elephant size, um, uh, this grotesque uh, grave site um, outside of Minsk. Um, and so in response to that empty archive, we have um, the tradition of testimony, the tradition of choir, uh, right? The idea of 
Kwai, of course, goes back all the way to the ancient um, and um, in Greek a tragedy, uh, the Greek choir is usually the voice of truth. Uh, we remember the Greek heroes as lying and manipulative and um, saved by Deus Ex Machina at the end in some kind of um, gesture of dubious justice. Uh, but it is the choir that usually tells uh, tells the truth and tells the story how it is, how it feels to witness um, these um, tensions between the heroes. So I repeat after Joseph Brodsky here that the real tragedy is not when the Greek hero dies. The real tragedy is when the chorus dies. And Belarus is a country of a dead chorus, um, the, the dead choir, and so super literature is our answer to that. Um, Alessia Damovich, our writer, writer veteran, right as a teenager, he was uh, involved in the partisan activity. Um, and later on, uh, he uh, tries fiction, but realizes that he cannot write fiction. Uh, uh, he cannot play God. Um, uh, with um, with narrative uh, in a situation where a writer, an artist, has to become a human ear, as uh, Svetlana Alexievich, his um, student, calls herself calls herself in her Nobel speech. Um, a writer has to become a human ear um, and um, collect the testimony. And what's so interesting about this testimony is that people do not repeat the official narrative. They feel that they are outside of history. History is something that happens elsewhere in the center, but they're in the margins. So they have no claim on this language of official history. So they have to invent their own language. And when they're doing it, they're telling us how the history, what it means to be a human, um, living through these inhuman experiences. So when we read, Alexievich's books, when we read Wars and Womanly Face, we, um, what do the women talk about? They talk about getting their first menstruation during World War II. Uh, they talk about um, craving chocolate and sweets <laughs> uh, between, between battles. Uh, they talk about um, uh, horses, a horse is a witness, right? Horses left in a village that was destroyed. Um, and so, so they find a way of uh, talking about history that is very, a very creative way. Um, I think that an artist also comes from that same space of amazement rather than need for a narrative. If anything, as an artist, I'm looking to collapse what a historian does, to catastrophize it, right? A historian gives us the biography of a country with dates, facts, winners, losers, reasons, and consequences. And uh, it's all very important. But as an artist, I'm looking to catastrophize that. And I'm looking to... Um, uh, to, uh, to to create a new language, to come out, to come out of amazement, to create a different world uh, uh, built solely on sound and rhythm rather than on fact um, and um, and data. And I hope to create that kind of intense experience that is a musical experience. It is an experience of our inner musical eye rather than a historical eye. Uh, but I think that in the end, uh, we meet yeah, somewhere, hopefully on a reader's desk or uh, armchair or bed, wherever you read, where in one hand you could have a history book and in another a poetry book. That would be a wonderful place. Um, so Rufina had some technical difficulties, but she's back. So I wanna, I wanna pick up with what you just said, Valgina, and apply it to Rufino's art and see if, if she can take this up too, and to describe maybe how she attempts to invoke or remember emotional history in her work. But also, as you said, in terms of how she, Rufina, how you might see yourself as a historian of sorts, you are weaving, literally weaving narratives using 
um, these techniques and these uh, cultural tropes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Um, do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, first of all, uh, everything that is happening around uh, and uh, that we see actually on internet and uh, in Belarus is, uh, in general, uh, it's a history. One, one thing is the inspiration that I take from um, uh, the historical traditions. Uh, but the other, the other thing is uh, that I somehow review uh, uh, this in a, um, in a new uh, stylization, how could I say? But everything what I depict is actually an event that happened, that is an history. And uh, the funny thing about it is because I uh, try to react um, on, like try to, try to react uh, very fast, but, um, uh, and okay, uh, there is uh, um, an event and uh, uh, I am inspired by it, by it. Then I create a picture and then I post it on Instagram. Um, reviewed the, the history somehow, and then people who are in Belarus uh, right now, they see it, and then it helps them to, I don't know how to say, maybe redo or to continue fight. And so like, like I'm influenced from the history and somehow art uh, could influence the history at the same. It's like, it is, it's like a circle. I feel it like this and, um, I don't speak not only in the context of my works. I think in general, art uh, has this power um, to react uh, to the history, um, to the history, and to um, influence on it somehow. This is what I think. Sasha, maybe the way to extend this to you is to ask you to speak more about. Um this cyclical history and emotional history um, associated with the, the ritual textiles you described, the, the Rushnik Abedinik, and how it was employed during World War II and, and how it has been re-employed um, more recently. What does that mean exactly? Can you tell us a little bit more? That really intrigued me. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I actually want to go back a little bit to your earlier question and say, and if you posed this question to me a year ago when I was reading a lot of Emil Durkheim and Sarah Ahmed and studying this emotional turn in humanities, I would have a ready-made question for you right away and have said that, well, obviously emotions are socially constructed and arts and letters are instrumental in shaping our collective bodies and discourses. And this is why what these guys are doing is just, they're inscribing the Belarusian bodies into these cultural maps. And this year something happened to me and I, have, I no longer have emotional distance from the subject matter. What we are doing right now is a lot of emotional processing. And artists and poets intuitively know how to work with these legacies and process emotions a lot better than others do because art is a trans transformative experience. And of course, textiles is very special because it is highly therapeutic. And what Rufina does, it's either those digital crosses or physical stitches when you enter the cycle of repetitive motions and go over and over again, actually inscribing this trauma that you lived onto the textile, you enter a very ancient ritual of sorts. And it is psychosomatic, you help yourself to work through this problem and deal with it. And when people come as a collective, it does something to the situation. So collectively, and Valjana talked about collective testimonies, and this is exactly what Belarusian culture is. It's choruses, voices everywhere, and groups coming together and performing the cultural work. And I've experienced it in different facets and different manifestations for the past eight months. And the power of this collective work could hardly be underestimated. And I think that those literary testimonies and the threads in fabrics, they just overlap really well and complement each other as such. Um, so this is my short answer to your question. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the repetitiveness of, of weaving because it, 
it brings me to my second question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And that is, um, in, in a recent interview, Rufina noted that, and this is a direct quote from her, this year's National Awakening simply demanded this technique of national embroidery. And Valjina, you have also commented that the repeating pattern of Belarusian embroidery is a refrain, a chant that insists on good fortune, good weather, health, and prosperity. And Sasha, you just discussed this ritual associated with textiles. Um, and, and one where art, you have, you have said, can be created to better the country's future. So I, I guess the question here is, um, are you optimistic about the future of Belarus? And are you optimistic about the protests succeeding and bringing real change? And has, has art helped bring about any change? Maybe, maybe start back with you, Sasha, since you're on my screen. So I'm a bit wary of sounding naive and declaring the overcoming power of art over the dictatorship. But I have to tell you that I personally see the light at the end of the tunnel. And the situation right now is a lot better than it was 20 years ago, for example. Um, another problem is that we have a catastrophic situation with our arts today, because unlike 20 years ago, people can no longer exhibit in the country. And the art journalism is almost non-existent right now because journalists are already in danger and there's just not enough people to write and to cover and to publish. And this is another problem that we're experiencing these days. But I believe that it will come to an end and we will see the future, the brighter future for many of us. Thank you. Valgina, do you agree or? Oh, I, I neither agree nor disagree. I think that um, the, um, I think that what um, poetry can do is create a ceremony of coping with this uh, state of weariness <laughs> uh, that um, as Sasha describes. I think that, um, of course, a poem is not um, a weapon that can be used against um, uh, dictatorship, um, and um, but I don't think that it also aims at that. I do not think that as an artist I'm seeking justice or putting anybody on trial, or that I'm seeking um, some kind of satisfaction or conclusion. Uh, I think that what an artist um, gives is uh, a chance of catharsis, um, a chance of, uh, which is right, a, a word that means purification and cleansing by an intense emotion. And uh, in a Belarusian pagan culture, we um, achieve this intense emotion through repetition in a chant. Um, so it's a verbal repetition uh, uh, that um, uh, is, uh, has the power of hypnotizing, uh, of losing oneself. And it's also the repetitive patterns, the motions of uh, weaving, of embroidery, that is also the art of losing oneself and creating an intense emotion, um, which offers, which is a ceremony, it's ceremonial, it's a ritual, really. Um, and, um, and so it's that's alternative space where, um, and that's also what, right, what memories in general, it's not a temporal phenomenon. Memory is not something that is, that belongs in the past and that is extracted from the past uh, when we need it. Um, rather, um, present and past form a kind of a space uh, together. Uh, so certain stories, like for me, the stories of my grandmother's survival, for instance, are insepar inseparable from my maturing and from my childhood and from my growing up. And why one could say that I did not live through World War II, for instance, yet the stories of World War II are integral part of um, of my childhood and of my becoming a person that I am, because that idea of memory that is not even mine belongs 
in uh, the present belongs in the present of my life and art is also a space yeah it is a space of experience a space we could enter and move through um and so that's what it offers um uh, but um but there is no other practical uh weaponry <laughs> power to it rather art is very impractical yeah and um, that's what it calls for for a very imp for a world that also can embrace uh impracticality uh it's a very anti-capitalist in uh, in this it's all about negative capability it's all about um multiplicity and uncertainty um and it's all about questions rather than answers which is why it's also so dangerous all right to any kind of official um narrative um so um so yeah um i think that we we repeat and the history repeats, unfortunately, too. And uh, we'll see who, who will be the first to break that pattern of repetition. Rufina, maybe you can pick up on this comment. Uh, thank you for a question. I just wanted to say about um, how do I feel um, of my artwork because um, <laughs> I uh, when I started, I uh, received a lot of m messages from people uh, that it was amazing and that it uh, helped them to uh, rise somehow. And uh, these features um, give them energy to fight. And uh, sometimes it's uh, there. There's a quiet times and people don't write, but. Uh, Sometimes I don't have time to create new pictures, but still when something um, very important happens in country or actually that was uh, very interesting because people from Russia started to write me, please keep doing pictures because we all are uh, uh, looking and watching on it and uh, we're looking forward to, to see new pictures because how, would I understand this? Uh, it gives the energy to people. So I think uh, it's very um, important work of art um, when artists um, transform somehow the reality and um, give it in another energy to people to consume it and to, to feel well and to keep fighting. Uh, if we speak, for example, of political artists, uh, for example, but in general, I think it works anyway. It doesn't have to be only uh, connected to protests, but um, art has this power, I think. And okay, yes, <laughs> I would love to see uh, the very um, soon and um, bright end of all these events. Thank you. Uh, let's take a couple questions from the audience.